Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Concordia University's Fourth Space. Thank you for joining us for today's event, Grow at Home, Cult of Action Seedling Workshop. To help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube live from Fourth Space, which is located on unceded indigenous lands in Chajage, Montreal. Here at Fourth Space, we work with our university community to mobilize knowledge by co-creating daily activities to examine research questions and projects in development here at the university. We are running this event as a live stream meeting, so we welcome any comments and questions with a raised hand or via the chat if you're here by Zoom. And for those of you who are here in this space, please join in and it's gonna be a good workshop. So with that, it is now my pleasure to hand it over to your workshop lead today, Caleb Wolcott. Hi, um, yeah, thanks so much to the fourth space for having Co-op Cult of Action for these, these workshops today. Um, we're starting off with a seedling growing workshop and then we are um, in the afternoon, later in the afternoon, gonna be having a oxymil workshop. So um, making your own herbal tinctures from home. I'm going to start off with a bit, a bit more extended of a land acknowledgement. Um, so we as an urban agriculture cooperative work with the land and we understand how agriculture has been a, a, central, a central tactic and strategy and tool used in the process of, co of um, colonialism in, in so-called Canada. So for example, um, an agriculture which has gone hand in hand with decoupling indigenous peoples from their traditional um, ways of relating with the land and gathering food and hunting on the land. So on the prairies um, in the 1800s, First Nations people were put into, into reserves um, and not allowed to hunt and roam um, or, or hunt, hunt roaming herds of buffalo as, as they had pre-colonization. Um, and this significantly decoupled indigenous peoples on, on the prairies with their um, traditional food practices and led to disastrous starvation and, and lack of, of food security. Their food was withheld by the McDonald government um, to, to force indigenous people to be reliant on rations provided by the Canadian state. In the Indian Act, um, Canada's first piece of legislation and main piece of legislation on Indigenous peoples, the Macdonald, um, the, the Canadian government banned Indigenous people from purchasing agricultural equipment collectively, um, in engaging in agricultural transactions with people outside of any given reserve. Um, and so, first of all, taking away Indigenous people's traditional lifeways on the land, but also preventing um, Indigenous people from engaging in agriculture as all settlers had the right to. Um, this is not to mention the, the dispossession of land and free giving of land that the Canadian government did um, to, to settlers as they were coming to places all across this land. Um, at, at Cult of Action, one of the things that we, we do is donate 20% of the revenue we get from pay what you can vegetable sales to frontline indigenous land defense efforts um, as, as a form of, of reparations and, and land tax that we pay. And we encourage other folks to, to do the same and materially back up a commitment to decolonization. So to speak a bit about co-op cult of action, we got started um, two years ago. And this is our, oh, here we go. Our, our mission. So our mission statement is to build food sovereign communities. Um, and we do that where we grow in NDG as well as um, within the Concordia community more broadly. And then what we, we see our work as, as an explicitly political act. So we're committed to food justice, social justice, um, and the anti-colonialism, anti-capitalism that goes along with building a vibrant food system that is rooted around people, not profit. In terms of our more tangible activities, so we grow on about a third of an acre at the Loyola campus at Concordia, as well as on a market garden a bit farther outside of the city in Seneville. We host volunteering sessions there, experiential learning sessions. People from courses can get engaged. Um, people doing Concordia courses can get engaged and learn at the farm. We sell our vegetables at a pay what you can market. I'm at Concordia. Our, our market this year is going to be fully pay what you can, so it is accessible to anyone. 
And then we supply community food security organizations like the People's Potato, the Fri Au Vert, um, the Hive Free Lunch Program at Loyola, as well as organizations outside of Concordia, like the Depot, um, Head and Hands, Resilience Montreal, Women on the Rise, to try to you know, turn fresh food into the right that it is, um, not, not a privilege that only a few people can access. We also do a lot of education programming, like we're doing today with free, free workshops, community engagement events, um, collective suppers, barbecues, um, as well as a full summer, summer urban agriculture course that's run by Dr. Eric Chevrier, Dr. Mohamed al and Nico Schut, who are all members, members of the cooperative. And that's run at our various locations, touches on growing mushrooms, foraging, as well as the market gardening that we do. So today, what we're gonna be talking about is the step that precedes all of the season, um, growing seedlings. So we have a bit of a, a collaborative um, process here that we can start with. Um, when you think about the seedlings that you want to grow, things really break down into a couple main categories. So it can be overwhelming to think about growing all of your seedlings um, from the very start that you, that you want to have in your garden. You think, oh, I need to start three months ahead, but I don't even know what I need to plant. Um, and then, and then you, get, you get lost. But what there really are are you know, five or six core categories of seedlings that you need to grow. And it's very consistent how you need to grow them um, throughout this whole category. And so you're gonna, you're gonna get a pretty, um, a pretty standard approach that's easy to follow and that you can kind of turn into your own systems at home. So I'll start off with thinking of a, of a, couple, of a couple of vegetables that, that folks like to grow just based on the seed packets that I have in front of me. So there are herb chives right here. Um, and herb chives are in the allium family. And then next one here is, is Swiss chard. So Swiss chard is related to spinach, believe it or not, which is also related to amaranth. So you can start seeing how these, these plant families work um, from, from, the, from the jump here. But Swiss chard and a number of other things we're going to put into a category called succession crops. But that, and so succession crops is a little, a little vague and unscientific. It's not a Latin name for a vegetable family, but it fits a number of things into it, a number of plants into it. And the idea with succession is that you're gonna plant it multiple times throughout the season um, so, that, so that you can have a continuous harvest. For example, Swiss chard, you know, it'll work, it'll grow well for about half the season. And then you're gonna want another, another Swiss chard variety. So a lot of this, a lot of other leafy greens fit into the succession crops category. Um, here we go, a cucumber. So this is an organic cucumber variety called straight eight. Some of the names are a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more fancy and some of them are a little bit less. So cucumber seeds are, are huge and so are the rest of the seeds in this family and it is the cucurbit family. And then, the other, family, the other two families that we're gonna talk about today are brassicas. So I have a kale seed packet in my hand um, that fits into the brassica family, as well as, um, as well as tomatoes. And tomatoes fit into the solanaceae family. Um, so a bit of a disclaimer here, I do not know how to grow flowers. Um, it has always been a thing that I have struggled with. And I have not taken the care to learn, although I am grateful for the other people at the cooperative who do that and also teach me a bit. So I'm not going to be teaching you how to grow flowers today because that would be, um, you would be not, not be getting set up for success. Definitely can work on the vegetables though. So if we start thinking about other plants that fit into these categories. So into the succession crops, I mentioned it's a lot of greens. The lettuce fits in there very nicely. You wanna grow lettuce in a lot of successions because if you've ever tried to grow lettuce in the middle of the summer before, it bolts really quickly. Um, it, which means that it goes to seed. It gets so stressed out that it wants to reproduce as quickly as possible before it dies. And that makes it go really bitter and shoot, shoot up flowers, which is not what you want um, from, from a, a tasty buttery head of lettuce. And then in the cucurbit family, it sounds like cucumbers, so it's really easy, but there are also zucchinis, squash, 
that fit into that category as well. Um, so those are really good crops to have in your garden, especially zucchinis, because they produce really consistently. There's kind of a classic, oh, in July, you, know, you can't even give away your zucchinis. That's because it's one of the easiest things to grow at home and also one of the easiest seedlings to grow. So we can talk about that. That's a good one to start with. And we can talk about that in a bit. The brassica family, um, so the kale. Brassicas all evolved from the same seed. They evolved from mustard. And believe it or not, everything from canola to cauliflower to kale to kohlrabi and radishes and turnips fit in the brassica family. Arugula fits in the brassica family. So it's you know, a massive family that, that contains a whole lot. Um, and they'll have very, very similar kind of clover leaf seedlings that you'll see. And they grow in pretty similar ways. Not all brassicas you're going to want to grow as seedlings, but we're going to get to that in just a minute. For solanaceas, um, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, that's what fits in this category. Some of your, some of your favorite um, crops to grow in the summer, some of the things that are, you know, the, your classic summer vegetables, uh, which are technically fruits, but yeah, tomatoes, hot peppers, things that you can make a nice um, ratatouille out of, basically. Um, these grow, these take a long time to grow, and they're the most important to start as seedlings because you're just not going to get a tomato harvest in this climate unless you start it as a seedling. We get our last frost in the middle of May. You can't grow a tomato from seed um, to, to fruit in that time before our before the days really start to get short in September and it starts to get cold and you're not able to grow anything else. And then jumping back up to the top here, what we missed is the allium family. Um, in the allium family, you have, it's the most mysteriously named, I think you have the you have onions, chives, green onions, garlic as well, um, and, and, and some other things that fit in there. Garlic is a little bit different. Um, we're not gonna be talking about going, growing garlic as, as seedlings. Um, but, but we can talk about onions and green onions and chives. Okay, so these are the main five seedling categories that we're going to talk about today. But to take a bit of a step backwards, we want to know why we grow seedlings um, in the first place. So growing seedlings um, is, is not, not something that you necessarily have to do as a, as a gardener or a farmer, but it really helps you for a couple key reasons. So helps you get a jump start on the season, um, and it helps you have strong plants going in. So early start and strong plants. And when you break it down like this, it starts to get pretty easy to understand. So as I talked about with tomatoes and peppers, you're just not going to be able to get a fruit before, uh, before the frost if you don't get an early start. Same thing with onions. This one is a little bit different. It gets really wet in the fall here. So even if you started growing onions, you planted them right in the ground with a seed, they can do that on the West Coast. They can do that in BC, but you can't do that here because our falls are too wet and the onions are gonna rot. They're not gonna have time to dry down. And that's what you really want when, when you go to the store, you get a nice dry onion. It's not gonna keep very well um, if, if you don't get an early start with it. For strong plants, um, the reason why we want to do this is, is twofold. First of all, you have a stronger plant going into your garden, you'll get a better harvest. So it is easier for a, di a disease to attack a tiny little seed that's just sprouting. It's easier for a mouse to attack a tiny little seed that's just starting. It's easier for a hard rainstorm to destroy a tiny little seedling. That's why we keep them indoors, growing seedlings until they're strong enough to plant out. And this is kind of linked to another idea, which is that you don't just want to go straight from inside your house to planting out um, a bigger seedling into the garden, um, because then it won't be strong enough. It won't be a strong enough plant. The other key reason with this is to deal with one of the biggest issues that you have in your garden, which is weeds. Um, unless you are some kind of like brilliant scientist who has developed a method to entirely grow without having any risk of weeds growing, um, this is pretty important. Because what you can do, you're never going to get rid of weeds, I guess, unless, unless you've figured out something that I haven't. But what you can do is outcompete the weeds. So you can plant plants that are going to grow faster than the weeds. If you're planting an onion, we all, we all know that onion tops are little tiny sprigs coming out of the ground. They are not going to shade out a weed in near enough time 
for that plant to compete with that weed. The weed is going to entirely overtake, especially because a lot of the weeds that we have um, in this part of the world are called broadleaf weeds. So, you know, plants evolve to photosynthesize as much as possible. Weeds are, you know, they, they want to grow as much as possible. So they have a broad leaf. They can catch as much sunlight as they can, a lot more than your, than your measly onion. But if your onion is already two and a half months old going into your garden, then you have a much better chance um, at, at, shading, at shading out those weeds and to rob them of the sunlight that they need. Okay, now to jump to what we need to grow seedlings. Um, and this is, this is pretty simple. It's, it's basically the things that you learn about in school that you need to grow plants. So you need soil. And soil has a couple of things in it. Soil has organic matter. This is all, everything that's decomposed, all the roots, um, all the old leaves of different things. If, you, if you're in a mature forest, they'll have centuries and centuries of leaves that have slowly turning into compost and turning into soil at different levels and just the, just the newest, freshest leaves at the top. So you, you want to mimic that in some way in your, in your potting soil. And then you also need some fertility. Um, as I mentioned, in a mature forest, all your fertility would be coming from that organic matter, but that's not realistic for how most of us are growing right now because you know, of all the paving of green space that has been done. Um, and, so, and so we do have to cheat a little bit and use, use fertilizer most of the time. Um, and that's what I have, I have here to, to show folks today and that we will be using when we're starting our seedlings. Um, you need water. Pretty simple, water is life, plants need water to grow. There's a bit of a trick with seedlings about not overwatering, not underwatering, um, but that, that's more of a thing that you learn, you learn by experience. And there are some, some ways to deal with that that I'll, that I'll talk about later. Um, other things that you need, you need light. The ideal is obviously sunlight, but most of us don't have a greenhouse that you know, gets suns from all of the directions. If we do have a greenhouse, it's probably on one side of a house or on one side of a building um, that doesn't get sunlight all day. So if you're going to be starting seedlings, most of the time you need supplemental light. Um, and this means grow lights. Best kind of grow light is an LED light, um, so it uses less energy. And it's really important that your lights are full spectrum. So full spectrum lights, um, you learn, you learn about the rainbow in, in, any, in any basic, I guess, physics class. Um, that basically, if you're getting a full spectrum light, then you have all of the colors of the rainbow. Different plants to grow the best need the full spectrum. If you're just using your home LED lights or your home you know, ceiling lights, they don't have a full spectrum of light. Um, and that means that the full spectrum of light is what comes from the sun, it means that it's not going to grow as strong. And even if your light is right there next to your plant, um, like right on top of the plant, your plant will still probably get leggy and look weak um, if, if you don't have full spectrum light. You need labor, labor and love. Um, there is mixed and circumstantial evidence about whether singing to your plants helps grow them. Um, that, is, that is a choice that you can make, but you are going to need to check in regularly, um, observe how things are growing. So at the very least, if things go poorly this year, you'll get a better start next year. Or if you're growing one of these succession crops um, like Swiss chard or lettuce or beets, for example, you can, you can learn from it and then do better next year. Okay, what else do we need to grow well? One of the kind of things that's not that's not really listed here. Um, I mean, you need you need you need seeds. We have a whole bunch of seeds um, in front of us, but that that's pretty straightforward. One of the things that's not listed here, but that is important, and goes to that point about strong plants that I was mentioning earlier, is that you need something mocking outdoor conditions. So, if you are if you're growing um, seedlings inside, you bring them straight outside. 
they're going to get destroyed by the wind, even if it's just a slightly windy, just a slightly windy day, and they're going to get destroyed um, by the sun because the sun is going to be too strong, especially if you're not growing um, with those with those supplement with those full spectrum lights. Um, and so, one of the processes to deal with this is called hardening off. And that is a really simple process that just means you take your seedlings outside for five minutes, you bring them inside for five minutes, right before, before you're, when they're kind of mature and when you're ready to plant them, um, or ready, ready to plant them in a week. And you put them outside for 10 minutes, bring them inside for 10 minutes. And then you go back and forth, slowly getting longer until you leave your seedlings out, outside, but still in their trays for a couple days. Um, and it, the process generally takes about, you know, maybe two weeks from start to finish um, of just bringing your plants outside and inside for short amounts of time um, to, to get them used to the sun, start them in the shade, and then bring them out. Don't do it on too windy of a day to start off with. And then your plant will be really strong and ready to go into the garden, and it won't have any kind of lag time when you're planting it. That's kind of one of the main things when we're moving beyond the seedling growing to, to transplanting it, to actually putting it in your garden is that you want for your plants to grow as strongly as possible. You want the plant to be not losing a single day of growing time. So if you plant your seedling into the garden and your roots are dry and they're not surrounded by a pool of water, you're gonna have lag time in growing. If you put them in the garden and the sun hits them and it's not ready for that sun or the wind hits them and it's not ready for the wind, it dries out all the leaves, you're gonna have lag time. And you most of the time, most of the time you'll see and the plant will just droop and look really nasty, especially if you're planting it. It'll look almost dead, especially if you're planting it on a hot sunny day. That's why you don't want to do that. Um, but it's it also, even if you don't see anything back for, uh, even if you're, it lo the plant looks perfect and healthy, good chance it's missing something that it needs. It has suboptimal conditions and you're still kind of losing out on some of the optimal optimal growing time that it has. Um, you know, this sounds a little rigorous, but, and it's, it's not important that everything is perfect at your home the first time you try it or when you try it. But I, what I'm trying to say is the, you know, we don't do anything close to perfect. Um, but, but you want to, you want to, I'm trying to present like the optimal, the optimal condition so that you can get as close to that as possible. Um, not to make it try to, not to make it sound scary in the slightest. A good, little, a good little trick is most of the time you can't bring them outside and inside until maybe late April, mid-April um, because it's too cold outside. Seedlings grow in an optimal temperature of 20 to 25 degrees, which is perfect because that's probably how warm your house is right now. Um, but you can use a fan. So you start the fan on number one setting and then you turn it to number two and you just put it on the plant. If you have a rotating head, it goes across the plants and then it doesn't, you know, it doesn't stick on one for too long. And that, that will slowly acclimate it to getting used to the wind. Okay, and now we can, we can just, we've kind of gone through mocking outdoor conditions. Exposing it to direct sunlight is important too. Um, so you're gonna have a lot longer, um, your hardening off period is largely for direct sunlight. Um, but if you, your hardening off process is, is to help with direct sunlight, but if, if you have a greenhouse or something like that where your plant is already getting direct sunlight, even if it's through a pane of overhead glass, not if it's through a, a lateral window, but if it's through a pane of overhead glass, that helps a lot. Okay, on to seeds. So what we have in front of us is just a bunch of grocery store seeds that you can get. Um, they are organic by McKenzie. McKenzie is not, not a good company. It's not an ethical company um, in any way, but these seeds were donated to us. So we, uh, we are using them today. Um, organic seeds, if you want to grow organically, grow, go really well. But the most important thing um, in your growing system at home is that you use organic methods with the, you don't use synthetic fertilizers like miracle Grow, um, and that you don't that you keep you know safe growing conditions so you don't have rats running around all of your all of your plants or something like that um, and that and that you care about caring for the soil so you know you add compost to the soil you keep the soil covered with 
with mulch of some kind. You plant a diversity of things. You rotate what you're planting all around. Um, these are the organic conditions that matter. Having an organic seed versus a not organic seed doesn't make a massive difference, except you can get a lot more interesting heirloom varieties out of organic seeds. So a good company that we use is called Tournesol. It's a local farm. They breed seeds right here. So they're in, they're just um, kind of near Vaudreuil, um, on the, just past the West Island. If you're getting seeds from Tournesol, you're getting seeds that are adapted to grow right here. Um, and so they're gonna grow the best. Um, and, I, and that's why I would suggest trying to get seeds from a local farm as much as possible. There's also a company called Gaia Organics, um, Northern, Northern Exposure Seed Company, I think, or maybe Northern Lights. I don't know. They're, just look around for local, local seeds. It's not important what, what the company is exactly. Um, and then you know, pick a variety that's interesting to you. Read the back of the label. The back of the label tells you about how it tastes, what it looks like. Look at the picture on the front of the label. Look online for, for what people think about growing that variety. You don't necessarily want to follow the growing conditions um, that are listed. Um, you don't necessarily want to follow the growing conditions that are listed on the, uh, on, on the back of the packet. In terms of, uh, OK, I'm going to go back in a slideshow view. Lovely. OK. Um, in terms of labor, I spoke a little bit about it. Check in on your seedlings. That's the most important thing. I spoke about light. Water, it is best to water from underneath your seedling. Okay, I'm going to show you the seedling containers that we have. So if you flip upside down most, most seedling containers, you'll see that they have holes in the bottom. That's for two important reasons. One, for water to drain out, to drain down. And another reason is so that water can be taken up by the roots from the bottom. So you want to have your seedling container in a, in a larger tray um, so that you can just put the water into the larger tray, a, a tray that doesn't have holes in it. And then once the seedling is old enough, it can take up water from the bottom. This is going to prevent one of your biggest issues, which is potential mold um, from growing on the top of the seedling or from the seedling getting to um, there a, a crust forming of some kind of moss on the top of the seed, on the top of the, the tray container or the top of the soil. And then in terms of soil, organic matter and fertility, what we have here, what we're growing with today is just your basic um, potting soil from the garden store. Although if you feel around in here, you can see that there is a bit of a stick um, and a bit of moss. Um, or, or a bit of uh, a bit of kind of leafy matter um, and a bit of wood. This is called perlite. Um, it is a, it's a naturally occurring um, like mineral substance that helps aerate the soil. And then most soils also contain a high most potting soils also include a high variety a high amount of peat moss, um, which is, which is mined really unsustainably from the North Shore of the St. Lawrence River. Basically, there are trucks that go in and scoop up um, levels of peat moss and then put it into potting soil, <laughs> which is horrible, but it's really, really good for growing seedlings. So uh, it's all the organic matter that you'll need. Um, in terms of fertility, what we have, a lot of fertility or fertilizers in organic growing are not chemical based. So. The most common fertilizer that's used in general in agriculture is synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, which is um, synthesized from fossil fuels and accounts for one third of the emissions of agriculture in Canada, which is stunning. So we always hear about cows um, and, and livestock being the worst thing for our growing, for, our, for agriculture. Synthetic nitrogen fertilizer is the same amount of emissions as all of livestock production in Canada. Um, so one of the, the biggest climate solutions that we can, biggest climate solution approaches that we can take in agriculture is using organic fertilizers that are not, that are not synthesized nitrogen. Um, a lot of organic fertilizers are 
waste products from different streams of our food system. For example, most organic fertilizers are slaughterhouse wastes. Feather meal, bone meal, blood meal, the, the otherwise would be unused um, and, also, and also different manure-based fertilizers. So chicken, you know, pelleted chicken manure is very popular. What I have today is bone meal. So basically standard slaughterhouse waste that would otherwise be going into the garbage and that instead we can use to grow beautiful vegetables. Um, I don't have a ton with me today, but when you're growing, you just wanna mix that into your soil at a fairly even rate. So what I have, if we're kind of gonna start the seedling growing process here, is a bin with dry soil in it. And you, whenever you're using a fertilizer, you wanna look up the rate of, um, the rate of fertility that's needed. And then probably if it's an organic fertilizer, add just a little bit more because you want your seedlings to be really strong. If it's a synthetic fertilizer, which again, I don't rec recommend using, if it's something like miracle Gr Grow, which I don't recommend using, you don't wanna put more in because that's gonna burn your plants. But organic fertilizers often undersell the amount that they need. Um, and and you know, your seedling needs, if we're gonna use this little tray here, your seedling needs all it can possibly get from this you know, two inches squared of soil. And so you wanna make sure that it has a bit of fertilizer in it. I'm gonna put this entire packet in here and I'm just gonna spread it evenly over the soil. So you want about in this amount of soil here, which is maybe a third of one of these small Rubbermaid bins, you wanna put um, about a couple tablespoons of that fertilizer in. We're, uh, we're really gonna get into it. Um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of fertilizers. You, what you want is a balanced one. Um, something, every fertilizer will have three numbers on it, an N and a P and a K. Um, it goes in that order, nitrogen, um, phosphorus, not nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. No, sorry, N, nitrogen, P, phosphorus, K, potassium. And you want a bit of everything. The most nitrogen though, because nitrogen stimulates leaf growth. So all of the, what the seedlings will be growing is are leaves, not leaves and roots, not um, fruits. So phosphorus and potassium is needed for fruit growth, which is not it, which is important later in your growing, not for your seedling growing. And then there are tons and tons and tons of micronutrients that you also want in your fertilizer, and that will show up on on the packet on the on whatever packet you have as well. Okay, so water. Moving on to our next step. You want to seed not into dry soil, but into wet soil. And this is going to help with a couple things. Um, first of all, means that you're going to get the right amount of soil going into your um, going into your container. So if you put a bunch of dry soil in there and then water it, it's going to shrink down by about half. And then you'll you'll you know you'll you'll wonder your seedling will come up and then you know, it won't, it won't be able to even see the sunlight because it'll be shaded out by all of the, um, by its, because it'll be shaded out by the, by the sides of the container. And then the other thing that this will do is just ensure that you actually get full good moisture around the seed. Um, so if you're growing, if you're just watering from on top, then the water will probably pool up at the top a bit and that's the process that starts to lead to salinification um, and the, the salts being taken out of the soil, which is not good. And it also might increase the possibility of, of mold in the soil. Uh, you want your soil to be fairly wet and to be and for the water to be mixed in consistently. But if you pick it up, you don't want to be able to squeeze any drips of water out of the soil. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're looking really good, really good right now. Okay, I'm gonna go wash my hands off and then we're gonna jump back into theory for just a second.
Am I still sharing my screen? No. Okay, glorious. So we started with the seedling, the kinds of seedlings. And now we're gonna talk a little bit more about what, when you need to start, when you need to start these different ones. And we'll go over kind of the basics of the growing conditions for each of them. So I'm actually gonna escape full screen here. And the your alliums are the ones that you need to start earliest, especially if you're growing full season onions. So we said again, this is onions, green onions, chives, etc. You want to start these March 1st. They take about seven days to germinate. And they will grow quite slowly. And then a trick with these is you want to cut off the top. So they'll grow and they'll start to get tall. But then because they're onions and you want the bulb, you want to cut the top off so it redirects the energy towards the root. And you want to do this when it's kind of, you know, four to seven inches tall. You want to do this when you're when you're four to seven inches tall. Um, and then if it gets up to four to seven inches before you plant it out into your garden, then you want to cut the top off again. And you can just kind of keep that going. And the more and more energy you put down into the root, the better. Um, generally, if you're if you're growing this commercially, you're going to cut the top about three or four times. You are starting them March 1st because you're going to plant them in your garden on May 1st. So in that case, you have a two-month growing cycle in your, in your seedling tray. And with these, it needs to just be a tiny, the, the seeds, okay, the seeds of these ones are tiny, 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 itsy bitsy. Um, and this does not always translate into you only needing a small little container, but for these ones, you only need a small little container. If you're growing onions or scallions or anything else like that, you um, you only need a small you only need a small little container to grow. Um, you know, maybe a one inch by one inch square. And then the other trick with these ones is um, sorry. The other trick with these ones is that you can sow them into, so maybe two or three, um, three to five if they're scallions or chives into the same little container. So we call, when we're using containers like these, this is a tray, the full thing, and then inside is a cell. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six cells. And in each cell, you're gonna wanna seed, you know, three seeds or something like that. For your cucurbits, you want to start them a whole lot later. Uh, you want to start them three only three weeks before first frost, maybe four weeks, um, three or four weeks, or before last frost. And that is because if you let them grow for too long, they'll get really tall. And then since they have such broad leaves, they'll catch so much sunlight when they first go into the garden. And then they will be very sad because they will get sunburned and your, the leaves will not be ready for all of the sun that they will get. Um, and so less is more with the, with, the cu with the cucurbits, with the cucumbers and zucchinis and squash. You just want to have them germinated, have them kind of looking, you know, yeah, you just want to have them germinated. A little, a little fun story, but extremely bad luck growing, growing squash in my life. Um, one year, the farm I was working at was said, oh, you know, let's just so much work growing these seedlings. It's only gaining us three weeks. You know, the fall, the frost is getting later and later in the fall. Eh, we can just direct seed it. We can just put it right in the ground. Um, you know, that'll also reduce there being so much transplant shock when, when we transplant them out. Put them in the ground. Then crows ate an entire field of squash seeds. They ate an entire acre of squash seeds. Um, 
So that is another benefit of not putting seeds directly in your garden is that pests and birds love to eat seeds. If you're putting a certain seedling in, a lot less likely that a bird or a pest is gonna to wanna to eat that seed. These ones are the easiest ones to grow because they pop up so quickly. They'll pop up in five days. Again, these are rough estimates. So if you plant it and you don't five days, don't you throw out the container, wait for a week or something and it'll come up eventually. Um, most likely, unless something has eaten it or it doesn't germinate. And then these ones are important. You only want to grow one at a time um, or one per cell because we know that vocab vocabulary now. And that is because they have broad leaves, as I mentioned before. And so kind of like the weeds, they will shade each other out. They will compete for resources. Um, and that that's a... That, that's not, not helpful to their growth, obviously. A lot of people, because seed packets are so cheap and you get so many seeds in them, a lot of people like to seed two seeds or more seeds than they need in each, in each cell. Um, and in that case, you just need to, um, if, you're, if you're putting more seeds than you need into each cell, then as soon as they germinate, it's just a, a, you know insurance policy against one of them not germinating. Just pluck one of them out. Brassicas. Um, the trick with brassicas is that you is that they they come up in maybe three days. The brassicas you're gonna grow as seedlings are not your radishes, not your arugula, because they only take a month to grow or so. So if you seed those right into your garden, they won't have an issue. They grow so fast, competing with the competing with the weeds, um, and and you'll get an early start no matter what. So for brassicas, what you're going to want to plant is your broccoli, your cauliflower, your um, kale. Those are the main ones. Uh, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. Those are the ones, they all have a very kind of distinct circular small seed. Um, and you also just want to grow one, one per cell. The cucurbits, you only want to plant after the frost. And the brassicas you can plant out at the same time as your um, as your alliums, so May May first. Although these ones only take um, only take five weeks to grow. So my my organization of information here is not perfect, but you can kind of tell, you know, five weeks day you plant out, um, date you seed seed them. Here I say alliums you seed on March 1st, but the rest of them, cucurbits, kind of three weeks ahead of time, brassicas, five weeks ahead of time, so five weeks ahead of whenever you want to plant them out. With some of these, you can also plant a later succession, so plant some um, brassicas maybe in midsummer for you to put into the garden in August so that you have lots in the fall as well. For the other two ones, what I'm going to do is tell a bit of a you know, tell, give you a bit of a, a story, a bit of a lettuce story, and a bit of a pepper story um, based on what we have done at the farm so far. All right. So you can see here, um, full disclosure, these are not pictures of pepper trays, but they are the pictures of the trays that we have. So if the, um, if the bok choy labels are throwing you off, just pretend that they're pepper variety labels. We put all of our varieties um, for example, magenta there that you see at the end is a lettuce, just onto these little, little signs. And then we have, you can see the date that they're seeded, that the tray is labeled. So 413, April 13th. Um, and then the number, number 110, 109, 108. And that's linked to a spreadsheet that we have to keep track of all of our seedlings. Um, so this is not what you need to do at home. I would suggest at the very least writing the date that you seed something. Um, and the variety that you've seeded. And then you can know, again, it all comes back to observation, checking in what works well and what would work better next year. All right, imagine, get yourself into the mindset. It is March 1st, it is two weeks from now. You wanna start growing your seedlings. You wanna have beautiful, sweet bell peppers. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite to eat out of the garden in the middle of the summer. You're thinking to August, having a stuffed pepper with um, some and beans and vegetables inside of it. Nice. Did I turn my mic off? No. Okay. 
And then, so we plant them in there. About 10 to 14 days later, you start seeing what we have here on, on the left. Um, that is exactly what a beginning pepper little, little sprout looks like. So just two little leaves, short sprout. Um, a lot of seeds look like this when they're first coming up. So that's called the cotyledon phase. And it's when their first two leaves emerge. And then what you see on your right is the cotyledons that have gotten a lot bigger, as well as right in the middle of the two cotyledons where they meet, you're starting to see a couple little leaves come out. Um, and those are called true leaves. A lot of the time when you're looking online for different seedling information, what you'll see is plant it out when it has five true leaves, do this at the, when the first true leaves emerge, do this at the cotyledon phase. That's what that means, is that what you see on, on the left is the cotyledon phase because those are just the first two little leaves that emerge. It's the ones that poke out of the ground. And then the true leaf stage is when you start seeing them come up the middle. Peppers, I love how waxy the leaves are, how beautiful they are. They grow so slowly. As I said, they'll take 10 days um, for them to emerge, 14 days, sometimes even a bit longer if they're too cold. Peppers really, solanaceae, so tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, love the heat. Um, you want to give them as much heat as possible. If you have a heat mat, put a heat mat under them so that they stay warm and germinate fast. Pests also love to dig in and eat your pepper seeds. So if you have um, some kind of thing to put on top of, on top of the soil um, before, before the germination happens, if you have any kind of pest problem at home, uh, you should. So leave that on for seven days and then start to check. But what you don't want is you put a cover on to stop the pest from getting in and then it starts to germinate and then it doesn't have any light, then you're gonna get really leggy seedlings, which is something we'll talk about later. Legginess is a lack of light. Okay, so you see these, these beautiful seedlings on the right, that's, that's at a couple, you know, a couple weeks old, maybe, maybe three, four weeks after we've seeded them. Um, and you see there, you have pretty good germination. So every, every seed cell there has a germinated seed. And then a lot of these we thought were um, were old seed, that, so that they so they wouldn't germinate as well. So you can see there are a couple in each cell, but you don't want that. You want only one little sprout per cell. Um, and so what we did with those is we just split them apart. So we took the cell out, and then when we're potting them up, which is the next phase that we're going to get to, um, not not this one, but a one after that. When we're potting them up, then we put them in in separate. Um, and we put them in separate pots. So we split them apart really gently. But if you have a ton of a ton of them more than you need, you can just pick one of them off, pick whichever one is the weakest one, and then keep growing the one that you uh, that you want to grow. A lot of people will say, Oh, I don't want to kill the plant. That that is that is a mistake because if you leave both of them growing in the same cell, they'll both die. So it's a lot better to get rid of one than to leave both of them in there. Um, and if you really don't want to kill them, as I said, you can split it apart. All right. So we're back here down again, maybe maybe six weeks old at this point. No. Yeah, six weeks, five weeks old. And you have lots of true leaves. So the peppers, the peppers are not, not at the front of tray number eight there that you see, but kind of at the back of both of the trays. Lots of true leaves there ready to be potted up, ready to get into a bigger pot. The roots are just expanding out, you know, getting getting bigger than the than their little cell can handle. If this starts to happen and they don't if the roots don't have enough uh, fertility, and what you're gonna see is the leaves getting yellow. People think, oh, it needs more nitrogen. Um, yes, it needs more nitrogen. It needs more nitrogen because it needs a bigger pot. The way you give it more nitrogen is putting it in, in a bigger pot, not just like spreading nitrogen fertilizer on top of it. All right, this is not a great picture, but you can see on the bottom rack there, we have transferred our peppers from the previous slide into three inch pots. This happens when they have, you know, maybe two or three true leaves. So when they're starting to get really nice true leaves that are full size, you 
take your seedling, you take your little seedling cell out, maybe with the help of a knife, you, you pry it out and put it into a bigger three inch pot and that will help it grow to the size you want when you're transplanting it into the garden. And then we have our transplanting into the garden. You wanna do this before you get any little white pepper, um, white pepper flowers on your peppers, because if it starts to put any energy into flowering before you transplant it, then it won't have enough energy to put into its root growth and leaf growth that it needs to get established in the garden um, when, you're first putting, when you're first putting it in the ground. Um, I think that is about it when it comes to peppers. As you see, we plant our peppers alongside garlic and alongside flowers to have a biodiverse ecosystem um, at the farm. A lot of people will talk about pinching, pinching the tops of, of pepper plants off. Um, that's generally not a good technique in my opinion um, because it's easy to mess up and hard to get right. And then, and, and so not great for a beginner. We don't even do it. We don't even do it because it's just too high of risk because you can really stunt the growth of the plant. The other thing I will say about, about your pepper, your pepper transplanting is well the main the main kind of idea here is that you want to start it about you know 10 weeks before you're going to plant it 11 weeks before you're going to plant it so if you're going to plant it out in the middle of may after the frost here in montreal you want to start at march 1st but if you start it before like we have done in the past and, and made mistakes with um then like if you start at mid-february if you started even a couple weeks too far before the plants will get too big for even their three inch pods um, and then when plants are uncomfortable and stressed out, they will a, start making flowers because as I said earlier, they think they need to re reproduce as fast as possible. And B, they, they will start being more susceptible to pests um, because they're, they're stressed out again. So, uh, you know, a healthy plant is a happy plant. You just want to avoid stressing out your plants and, and having the right timing is important with that. So like, don't think, oh, I'm just going to get my plant to be so big before I put it into the garden, so I'll start it on January 1st. That might sound good in theory, but that's not your best option. Your best option is to actually start it when it says to start it. Um, although, honestly, looking online or following this presentation with the general plant groups is better than looking at the back of the seed packet because that does not always have your best information. Like, for example, the kale plant here, the kale seedling here says it takes... 10 to 14 days to sprout um like kale takes maybe three to five days to sprout so you know it's not not always perfect and that's just because they're uh you know every variety is a little bit different so i understand that they could make some mistakes on the back of these packets there's tons of information online what can go wrong growing seedlings we talked about a couple of things pests that is largely due to the seedling being stressed out in in where it's um the seedling being stressed out in its cell, it can get something called root bound, which is also it getting stressed out in its cell, which means that all the roots are growing into each other and into the plastic wall of the tray um, instead of being able to grow into more soil. And then it, you know, it doesn't have enough nutrients available in the tray. You're gonna solve a lot of these problems by just potting them up. If a seedling starts to look too big in its pot, if a seedling starts to turn yellow in its pot, just put it into a bigger pot. Easier to, easier to deal with the, um, with the moisture content in a bigger pot as well because you don't need to water as often. You just water a greater amount because a greater mass retains more water um, and dissipates more slowly. Like that's you know, why a little, your, little tiny, uh, your little tiny puddle that you dug on the beach as a child and filled with water will drain so quickly, but, but the Great Lakes don't, don't drain so quickly is because of the, the mass that you have there a mass of water um, and then like draining and evaporation, I guess. Another big issue that I kind of touched on earlier was that seedlings can get leggy. This is if they don't have enough light or not enough of the right kind of light. Um, and so we have a kind of perfect example in the next story in the little lettuce story that we're gonna tell here. Um, you see these and the thing to pay attention to, A, obviously they look unhealthy. They're floppy, floppy and they can't hold themselves up. The main thing to be able to tell that they're leggy is that you can see the, how far the difference, how, there's, there's stem and then there's one leaf and then there's more stem and then another leaf and more stem and then another leaf. 
Um, in lettuce, it shouldn't be like, you know, leaf, 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 leaf. All of the leaves should be coming out of the same central place. That's how you tell if your lettuce seedling is leggy. That's how you tell if your Swiss chard seedling is leggy. That's how you tell if your, um, you know, that doesn't work too well on peppers, but it's how you tell if your parsley seedling is leggy, is if there's a, if it looks like the stem is too large for the plant to actually support and the plant is starting to fall down. You really don't want that. Um, you solve that by, as is shown in that picture, I think this is them trying to solve the problem. You bring the light closer to the plant and you get a full spectrum light and you expose it to as much natural light as possible. You think, oh, eight days plants, plants need light for only eight hours a day because like eight hours a day is a work day or something. Plants will take 14 hours of light a day um, in the seedling phase. It's really kind of counterintuitive. I was shocked when I first started growing seedlings. I put the light on for, it's like, oh, I'm gonna put the light on for eight hours a day. That's like so much light, it'll be amazing because the light is so powerful and that you think it'll be able to absorb all of it at once, but plants are greedy for light. They will take as much light as they can get. So we can contrast this to, as you see all of the leaves coming out of the same, the same place um, from the bottom, from the bottom of the plant. And you, you see how much those, those two ones are kind of at the same stage of growth. The second one, so much sturdier. Little trick here is that if you get to the leggy phase, if, if your plants get leggy, no, you know, no worries, just bury them. Just expo get, fix the lighting situation and then bury all the stem um, and it'll, it'll be supported better. And it will grow, it will grow roots. It'll be all, it'll be all fine. Like it'll grow roots inside the cell. Okay, you've got, you know, you start your lettuce and most of the kind of quick succession crops, your lettuce, your Swiss chard, your beets, um, will take maybe five weeks to grow in the seedling um, in the seedling tray, and then you'll plant them out. Lettuce, you'll plant them out. They'll take another five weeks, and then you'll have a head of lettuce that's ready to harvest. This is a good little visual because it has, because um, you can see the, the cell, so the little block, that's a really root-bound seedling. There are a lot of roots that are wrapping around that one. That should have probably been put into a bigger pot or not grown so big. You don't need to grow your lettuce so big. That's that's a really a really nice lettuce seedling, but it's a little bigger than it needs to be. So definitely, when you get to that stage, you want to plant it out um, into your garden. You can even do that beforehand. Like honestly, it's better to plant it into your garden at this phase when it's a little bit too small than to wait until this phase. Okay. Um, that, that's kind of the, the main theoretical portion. So I've gone through how to plant each different, um, each different type or each different family of, of seed and grow each different family of seedling. We could do a little planting demonstration now. Um, we've already gotten our soil nice, nice and wet. And we've already added our fertilizer to the soil. You know, you can just get a little bit of this going, get, get a big bag of potting soil or a small bag of potting soil, depending on how many seedlings you're going to grow for your garden. Um, and then start a bin like this, add the fertilizer to it, and then just keep the bin, you know, you don't need to, it's okay to let the soil sit. Then you want to fill up, fill up the pot. Make sure there aren't any clumps in the soil, fill it up nicely. Now, once you fill it up, um, the, once you fill it up, you want to tamp down the soil a little bit. So even though, it went, since it's wet, that helps, um, but you're still going to have some, some excess air bubbles in the soil. And when you want seedlings to germinate or seeds to germinate, you need really good seed to soil contact. Um, the trick for this is you put on another, another pot of the same size and you just press down. You don't want to press down too, too hard to compact it, but you want to do like wrist strength, not full arm strength. And then you have these nice little divots. You fill up the nice little divots with a bit more soil. And then the golden rule, planting seeds, that will save you so much stress and so much time, is that for any seed, don't look at how deep it says on the back of the packet to plant it. Just plant it three times as deep as the seed is wide. 
three times as deep as the seed is wide. This is a cucumber seed. It's one of your bigger seeds, and it is so thin, um, even this one. So that that kind of golden rule there isn't isn't really you know your perfect rule because you're you know with a, with a lettuce seed that it's even tinier than this. There's no way you're going to get it that shallow. But what it goes to show you is that you don't need to plant the seed too deep at all. You just make a little divot with your finger, um, kind of halfway up your fingernail, really not deep at all, and drop your seed into it. And then what I would do is plant a whole one of these containers with little divots. Obviously, this is harder the smaller the seed is with your lettuce seeds, with your kale seeds, with your oregano seeds that are really tiny, that's when you're gonna wanna maybe just spread your whole packet over the, over the thing and then either split them up or just thin some of them out, kill some of them later. And you cover it up with soil and you're good to go. You have, you have your tray, this is cucumbers, it will germinate in a couple weeks um, and then you can you know, you place this under your light and you can water it right now or you can wait till tomorrow to water it. The soil should be wet enough that it has some good moisture content in it already and you don't want it to grow, you don't want it to get too, too wet. Overwatering, especially when the seedling is very, very young, is often worse than underwatering, especially if you're growing inside where the seedling doesn't dry out very quickly. Um, if you're growing in a greenhouse where it's really hot, you might need to water multiple times a day because the seedling will dry out really quickly. Um, but at home, that, that is unlikely to happen and you're more likely to have mold problems develop. So that was your overview of how to grow seedlings. The whole process of planting them out. When, when you need to plant them out into your garden, you just, you'll have a plant growing here. Just squeeze it out, make a little hole, make sure there's lots of water in the hole. Don't plant it on the sunniest day. Don't plant it on the hottest day. Don't plant it on the windiest day. Plant it on, like the ideal day is a 20 degree gray, gray day with no wind. That's never gonna happen, but just try to not have like the worst, the worst possible windy, sunny, windy shining sun um, conditions. And, and if worse comes to worse, if it's just that, that way for a week and you need to plant something into your garden, put it in, in the, in the morning, early in the morning or in the evening. All, if you want to learn more and loved this, um, we will, we've got our, our urban agriculture education program um, that, that runs at the Loyola campus um, that is also gonna run in St. Anne de Bellevue at our farm um, out, out there, as well as an urban foraging course and a mushroom cultivation course as well as a whole bunch more kind of one day workshops like this and open volunteering sessions. You can come by and volunteer, learn from us about how to actually do this, actually grow seedlings, actually plant things into the garden, and then get food to take home for yourself, um, a meaningful amount of food that you'll get compensated with. Uh, the people who enroll in our urban agriculture program will, will get a certificate noting their completion, which can be good for job, farm job applications in the future. Um, and then the foraging, the St. Anne course and the mushroom cultivation course are ones that we're really excited about. So we're running them for the first time this year. Um, and, and you can find out a lot more about that on our website, cultivaction.ca. So yeah, thanks so much to the Force Space for having, for having us today and hope to, hope to garden with you in the summer. Come, come by the farm anytime. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Caleb, for coming into Fourth Space today, for leading us through this workshop. I know I've personally learned a lot, so thank you for that. We're going to go ahead and close up the live stream now, but a quick reminder that this uh, workshop is already available on our YouTube channel if you'd like to revisit or share it. Please join us once again at 3 p.m. for the second workshop with Cult of Action, where we will be learning how to make oxymels. So, okay, everyone, and have a great afternoon. We'll see you soon. Cool. Lovely. Okay.